Uh, my name is David Shelvin, and I'm the president of Michigan Stock Smart Meters. Uh, we planned a program for you this afternoon, and it's going to consist of four talks plus a question and answer period. And we're going to try very hard to wind up by 4.30. So uh, the first talk will be mine. It will be a general introduction to smart meters. Um, the immediately following will be a talk by Diana Osterman, who's standing at the projector here and with her background in the industry. And then we'll take a 10-minute break only. Um, and we'll immediately start up again with another talk on privacy, which I will give. And then the fourth talk will be by Linda Kurtz, and she's, uh, she will be here, she is here, and uh, she's going to talk about what can we all do now that we know what the problem is, is there anything we can do about it? She's going to deal with action items. And then we'll have a question and answer at the end. I'm hoping at least 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. So let me get started um, <clears throat> with my talk. I may bump along a little faster than I normally would because we got off to a late start. Uh, can everyone see the screen okay? Okay. Um, and just, just to get an idea, how many of you here in this room already have a smart meter on your house? For electric. Let's, let's just make it electric. Okay. How many? Electric. Oh. oh. It's a minority of you, it looks like. At least two thirds of you don't. That's great. Um, and are you, I'd like to also get an idea, how many here are from Washtenaw County? Uh, fair number. And from Oakland County? Oakland County? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me get started. Um, I think a page down, please, what you want. Um, we're going to do an overview of how we got to the smart meter controversy and a dis discussion of recent and upcoming events that may have a bearing on this issue next. Um, first, I want to lead off because there's been a new development. DTE now has a new policy on opt-outs that has been approved by the Michigan Public Service Commission. This approval came through just May 15, so we're dealing with pretty much up-to-the-minute stuff here. Um, and the, the issue is that anyone, we know, we're going to talk a lot about what are the harms of a smart meter today. But what you need to know about this new policy is if you want to avoid those harms, they're going to make you pay a fee. Uh, there's an upfront fee of approximately $67, and then you'll pay approximately $10 a month indefinitely or until next year when they'll probably bump it up to a higher number. So they're going to make it expensive and somewhat punitive for you if you do not wish to have one of these um, devices on your home. Next. Pardon? There is the Oh, I'm sorry to go. Um, now, we think, we think it's reasonable if an organization is going to provide us with a service or a benefit that they should be paid for that. They should charge for that. But we don't think it's reasonable when an organization chooses to do something which is harmful to the public at large and to their customers and then try to exact a fee for avoiding that harm. That's right. That has all the elements uh, of a shakedown. And, uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we explore this, I, I hope that by the end you'll agree that charging these fees is not right and be ready to join with us in the fight to do something about it. Next. Okay, first, what is the traditional meter? It's called an analog meter, and it looks like that. I don't know if you can all see it, but uh, I'll just walk over that way. Right here, you have the big horizontal wheel that goes around slowly, and above that, you have the, the four little clock dials. So. I think most of us have seen this at one time or another, if you haven't read your own meter. Okay, next. These meters, typically, since they can, must be read manually, they have to send somebody around once a month, they can only provide the utility with the homeowner's total usage for the month and many feel That should be enough. <clears throat> now, the smart meter looks more like this. This happens to be a picture of the iTron smart meter, which is the one that DTE is installing everywhere in the service territory. Consumers on the other side of the state may be using a different meter. We think, uh, 
from what we've seen so far, they're using GE meters, but they're planning to install iTrons also. Uh, the characteristic of this is it has a digital display. It looks like a, a computer display, those digits there. And you can see that it's an electronic meter. There's nothing electromechanical about it. Next. The functions of the smart meter are that it can measure and store or transmit usage information in intervals of an hour or less, enabling the utility to see your usage broken down, in some cases, at the exact time of day. They can take snapshots of your usage whenever they want. They can take a snapshot every minute if they want to, how much you're using in a, in a given minute. Uh, it uses radio waves, or it could use a hardwired internet connection for real-time transmission of the data to the utility. Uh, there's two-way communication between the meter and the utility, and that is so that they could send a signal to the meter to interrupt service if somebody's not paying their bill. Also, the meter can send a signal to them to notify them if there's a power outage. And the third thing, of course, is that they want to be able to send signals to the meter to turn off particular appliances in your home. We'll get into that more as we go along, but there's going to be a new generation of smart appliances that all have chips in them, and the utility will ultimately be able to decide if it's peak load and they're having trouble meeting the demand, they'll decide that maybe you don't need your air conditioning right now, or maybe Maybe you don't need your washing machine right now. They'll turn off particular appliances in order to balance their load. That's what they're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. um, the meter acts as a gateway for communications to and from individual appliances. Mm -hmm. Question, is this, is this data collection really necessary? Um, typically, it's justified so, by some sort of so-called green agenda. And we're going to explain why that doesn't really make sense. It's, this is not green technology. Uh, what it does is it reveals information to the utility and possibly to others about your lifestyle and heretofore private activities in the home. Let's examine the arguments that the utility uses to see if they really need all this data. Why do they need the data? What do they say? To encourage customers to conserve energy and to shift some of their energy demand to off-peak times of day. And this conservation is going to be encouraged by providing customers the ability to see their usage uh, by the hour through an internet display or in real time on a home monitor. Do these meters conserve energy? No. Only the customer can do that by making changes in their lifestyle. There have been various pilot studies done, and none of them to date has shown prove that consumers will change their behavior enough because of this new information to significantly save energy. Uh, DTE was not able to establish this. They did pilot studies down in Harsons Island and Gross Hill, and they were supposed to prove to our Public Service Commission that this program is paying for itself. They were unable to make that showing. Um, nevertheless, the Michigan Public Service Commission has authorized mass deployment of smart meters, even though the pilot program did not show an economic benefit to the customer. Yes. Um, as a result, Michigan's Attorney General sued the Public Service Commission, and I'm speaking here of former Attorney General Mike Cox, started this lawsuit several years back, and it's been continued by the present uh, Attorney General Bill Schutte. Um, and they won a judgment from the Michigan Court of Appeals that required the Public Service Commission to go back and do a, a redo or a do over of their administrative hearings process to again hear evidence to show why, if these meters pay for themselves. The case is proceeding now, but we won't know the results of it until, uh, I say next summer, but it'll be this summer now. Why else would the utilities need all of this data? Well, they want to implement something called time-of-use pricing. What that means is they want to be able to charge you more for each kilowatt hour that you use if you're using it during peak load hours. Let's say you're using, you're running your air conditioning and your dishwasher and your, your dryer between 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening, that's peak load hours. They have trouble generating enough electricity to meet the demand during those hours. So what they want to do 
where you might be paying 12 or 14 cents a kilowatt hour now, regardless of the time of day, they may want to try to do a much higher price, 30, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, even maybe during the peak load hours. And then supposedly they give you a lower rate, lower than what you're paying now, if you agree to do your laundry in the middle of the night. Such a benefit. Um, okay, does this work? Well, the pilot study, they, they, they did an experiment with these charging different rates at different times a day. And it didn't, it didn't work out. It didn't pay that the incentives were sufficient to make people change their habits. For one thing, a lot of people can't change their habits all that much. Um, retired people are not going to stay up in the middle of the night to do their laundry. Uh, they're going to do it during the day because they're home during the day. People that work on night shifts, um, they're not around to do it in the late evening hours. Uh, and maybe the only time they can do their laundry is during the day. So a lot of people's habits aren't going to change that much just because it costs more sometimes in the day. But, okay, let's say, let's sit all that aside and say that maybe in time with enough education, people would learn to change their habits. Just suppose. Would, would we really need, um, would we really need, um, can you back up one slide? Um, Okay, you're okay, next slide. Would we really need to have this so-called smart meters and smart grid in order to establish, in order to provide these incentives? No, not really. All that would be needed is a dual register meter that keeps track of your peak load usage on one register and your normal usage on the other. Um, next. It might look something like this. The utility would send a signal to the meter during the time of peak demand to turn on the peak usage counter. And that would be the upper one here, where you see 029874. Let's say that's your cumulative peak usage for the year or, or since you started service or whatever. <coughs> when that signal is on from the utility, you would charge the higher rate and it would be kept track of on that top counter. When it's not peak usage, that signal would go off and your usage would be tracked on the bottom counter where you would pay the lower rate. That's all that would be needed to implement uh, time of use pricing. Don't need smart meters for that. Next. Um, why else do they say that they need all this data? Well, to eliminate the cost of meter readers. The answer to that is that there are systems already in play all over the country called AMR systems. They're not smart meter systems, but they do automatically report your readings to the utility once a month when a drive-by vehicle goes down the street. That will take care of eliminating the cost of manual meter reading. Um, then you might say, well, are they necessary in case of power outages? One of their big arguments is, after a storm with downed wires and so on, they say they have trouble restoring power. It takes a long time to get all the people restored, and we've seen that, I'm sure, in this area. Um, they say that a lot of times they think they fixed a neighborhood, and as their truck is driving off to the next neighborhood, they get a call that one house or a few houses that where they, the area that they just left are not fixed. They say if you have automatic alarms, they would never leave a neighborhood until everybody was powered up in that area. Uh, but even if that's the case, and we need if we need that feature, all that's necessary is a little radio signal battery powered transmitter that only transmits when there is enough. Next. Who does pay for all this? Of course, the answer is we all do. We pay it through our federal taxes. Um, our federal government has provided three and a half billion dollars of subsidies to the utilities to put these systems in. We're all paying for that three and a half billion dollars. And what they can't get that way, the rest they get through just passing the charges on through you through your monthly utility bills. Where else are these being installed? All over the world. If you see this map where all those little red circles are, and you may not be able to read the letters, but in each red circle it says AMI, that's automatic metering interface. So those are smart meters. So the United States, Mexico, Canada, virtually all of Europe, Brazil, um, South Africa, and it's not on this map, but there's several in the Middle East and in China and Japan. So. Practically every industrialized country in the world is putting these in. So, 
Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but there's a reason why every country is doing it, okay? And we'll get to that a little later. Why are these things controversial? First of all, it's an invasion of privacy. We have this thing called the Fourth Amendment. Our founding fathers understood very well how important it was to the functioning of this nation that people have such a thing as the ability to go about their business and conduct their affairs without interference. What they were thinking of mainly was interference by government because they had just recently experienced oppression by the British king and his agents who were harassing the people, breaking into houses, stealing people's records, um, generally making it very difficult for people to live their lives. So they passed the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment says that uh, your personal papers and effects are to be secure and not to be invaded unless they have a warrant. And there are procedures for getting a warrant. A police officer has to go before a judge and give probable cause why a warrant should be issued to um, go into a particular house and search a house. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, we've seen that breaking down in many areas with the no-nut drug busts and whatnot. But in theory, that's how this country was set up. And it's still, by and large, true for most things other than drugs. Um, so the first problem with the meters is that they're breaking down that Fourth Amendment barrier. And while you say, well, it's not the government that's putting these meters in, it's the private utility companies, and that's true. But the private utility companies are doing it at the behest of the government. Um, make no mistake about that. First of all, they've been given three and a half billion dollars in bribes to do it. Then they've been told that they can recover every last dollar they lay out and then some through rate increases from the state and public utility commissions. So they have nothing to lose by doing this. In fact, there's a good deal of profit that they can gain by doing it. But they are not doing it at their own initiative. They're doing it at the behest of government. And the practical effect of it is that the government will have access to private activities going on in your home. I think in this day and age, nobody doubts that if uh, a police officer, state, local police officer, or federal agent, uh, ask the utility company for information from your meter, they're going to get it. And they won't need a warrant. So it is breaking down the barrier. That's a very significant barrier. Um, the next reason why these are confidential is health. Now, we know that a certain percentage of the public uh, is what we call electrosensitive or electrohypersensitive, it's sometimes called. These are folks who will experience immediate um, symptoms if uh, they walk into an area where there is too much radio frequency radiation going on, or perhaps any. Did you have questions here? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, I forgot to say at the beginning, but we are asking everyone to please hold your questions to the end of the Q&A period, because we've got a lot to get through and we'll never get there if we, if we stop all along the way. So. Um, Electrosensitives are variously estimated to be somewhere between 3% of the population and 15% of the population. These get immediate symptoms. Headaches, nausea, heart palpitations, inability to sleep at night, and this kind of thing. But that's not the only health problem. The entire population, in the judgment of medical doctors, Scientists who have analyzed this and published their work in peer-reviewed journals, this is not junk science, this is peer-reviewed science, have concluded that in the long run, talking 15, 20 years out, the entire population is at risk. And the analogy that I like to make is the canary in the mine. Okay, I don't know how many of you know this, uh, but it used to be the case in the old practice in coal mining was the miners would take a canary into the mine. And this was because methane gases would build up in the mine. And if they weren't detected soon enough, they would all pass out unconscious. And then they would die from exposure to the methane gas. So the canary was the early warning signal. They brought that into the mine. If the canary started to look sick, they all got out of the mine real quick. So I'll back up a sec. So my point here is that, yeah, we could say, OK, these electrosensitive people, they're a minority. We don't, we don't have to worry about them. 3% of the public. Why should we determine the whole technological future of this country based on 3% of the public? And I'll tell you why. Because they are 
in a sense, are canaries. They're telling us there's a problem here. In the 15, 20 years down the road, we're all going to have health problems. The kind of health problems we're talking about are neurological illnesses like Parkinson's diseases, um, Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's, other kinds of dementia, um, cancer, also it's known to be related to electromagnetic field. So, okay. Another problem with these is that they have been known to interfere with medical devices. When we've had reports, you know, these are immediately our anecdotal uh, reports, but uh, we've had incidents of people whose pacemakers stopped working, heart pacemakers. Some people wear um, another type of, uh, well, that too, but I'm thinking of brain stimulator, I think is the one I'm thinking of, yeah. There's various medical devices that could be compromised by the amount of radio energy that these things are putting out. Uh, next. We've had also reports of damages to household appliances, things like uh, stereo equipment, uh, high-end audio systems, even had refrigerator motors burning out uh, soon after the smart meter was installed. And then the next thing is, and, and I think we should really worry about this one too, the entire grid becomes vulnerable. No terrorist or hacker has succeeded, to my knowledge, in the last hundred years in bringing down our nationwide power grid. It's been remarkably stable, except when we have major damage from storms. When lines are brought down by fallen trees. Other than that, it's been a remarkably stable network. Now, what we're doing is we're making this whole power system uh, internet friendly, so that anyone with computer hacking skills and access to a computer could learn what are the codes that do certain things. What are the codes that turn off people's meters, for example? There's automatic disconnects in every meter. Uh, what are the codes that would shut down a generating plant? You know, taking it beyond the smart meter to the smart grid. Generators, transformer substations, things like this could be shut down by computer signals that some hacker is sending out from his laptop while he's sitting at a coffee shop. So, if you want that, uh, actually it was a former CIA uh, chief. Wolsey, I believe his name is James Wolsey, in an interview with ABC News, said, you know, with this smart uh, meters, uh, if you leave your house on a hot summer day and, and you arrive at work and you realize you forgot to turn your air conditioning off, uh, no problem. You know, you just pick up your smartphone and you send a signal and it turns off your home air conditioner remotely. But he says, if you can do that, so can some guy in Shanghai. <laughs> 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 Okay, there's also a risk of house fires. I'm not going to hit that one too hard because these are, this is a transitional problem. They'll probably get it right eventually, but that's what happens. <laughs> okay, how did all this stuff get started? There was a conference called the Rio Environmental Conference in 1992, Rio de Janeiro. First, our first President Bush, George H.W. Bush, informally committed this nation to some international programs that were being pushed as part of a green agenda. The goals were laudable. Uh, the goal uh, is to conserve energy, um, to reduce the, uh, the carbon footprint, and uh, hopefully avoid uh, greenhouse gases and, and, of course, the possible effect of that on, on climate. So that's what they were trying to do. Uh, it was even a noble objective, uh, but he made an informal commitment that we would do a bunch of things to conserve energy in this country. Three successive U.S. presidents continued this uh, informal commitment that the first President Bush made. In 2005, Congress passed the Energy Policy Act, stated purpose to reduce our carbon footprint. 2007, Congress passed the Energy Independence Act, purpose being to reduce our dependence on Mideast oil. Those are two of the precursors to all this. 2009, Obama's in there. He passes his stimulus bill and there's three and a half billion dollars to promote smart grid initiatives. Guess what? The utilities began to salivate. <laughs> you, they all rushed to get their share of this, of this uh, bounty. Yeah. And in Michigan, we had two pilot projects done by Detroit Edison. 
if we're supposed to culminate in a cost-benefit study. I think I mentioned that one already. Next. Uh, there was no cost-benefit studies done at the end of these pilot projects. 2010, Public Service Commission issues orders that if the utilities choose to deploy smart meters, they can charge the cost back to their customers. Then Attorney General Mike Cox sues the MPSC for that decision, arguing there can be no cost justification to burden customers for unproven technology. Detroit Edison began a massive rollout in Oakland County and parts of Detroit. And by now, they, they're pretty much through Washtenaw County as well. And these installations, I think almost without exception, are forced. Everyone is told they must accept a smart meter or their electrical power will be terminated. If you try to refuse a smart meter, this is probably what the technician from, from the independent contractor that DTE hired would tell you. If you don't let us install it, you'll get a 10-day letter, and 10 days later, they'll turn off your power. This, to my knowledge, has not happened to anybody yet. This was more bluff and bluster than anything else. In April of last year, the Michigan Appeals Court ruled uh, against the MPSC. Next. So we've, we've covered what they say are the reasons for all the smart grid deployment. And I think we've been able to pretty well discredit most of the reasons why they claim they're doing that. Why are they, what in our judgment is the real reason why they're doing it? We think it's about control. It's about controlling people and how they can use energy in their homes and in their businesses. If you want to control something, first you've got to be able to monitor it. So they put in a detailed monitoring system, which is the smart grid, and then impose energy rationing. They'll tell you how many hours a day you can run your air conditioning. They may take control of your thermostat. They'll tell you when, when and how many times a week you can run your laundry and so forth. This is all probably in our future, although the utility isn't admitting it yet. Finally, um, we are very grateful that one of the state representatives in the Michigan House, Representative Tom McMillan, and he's from Rochester, Rochester Hills area, he has introduced a, a new bill, a proposed law uh, in the legislature, which most of us refer to as the McMillan bill. Uh, later on in the program, uh, after uh, well, much later on in the program. I'm going to go into more detail about what's in the McMillan Bill and why we should all support it. That's the end of our first presentation.